chance to think about this a little bit, let's take a look and see what utility a numbers prime factorization gives us in terms of predicting its factors. I'll go ahead and take a look at our overhead now. So we're supposed to take the number 72 and find all its factors first. So let's see. If I have the number 72, then um, what are its factors? So um, its factors are 1 and 72, 2 and 36, um, 3 goes in there, um, 2, uh, 24, 3 times 24, let's see, 4 goes in there, doesn't it? Let's see, 4 and 18, I think, is that right? 4 goes in once, 32, 18, yes. 5 doesn't go in, 6 does go in there, right? 6 goes in once, uh, 12 times. 7, I don't believe, 8 does go in there, it's 8 and 9. And then, of course, once I hit 9 here, it'll be 8, which means I've hit the turnaround point, so... So these would be all the factors of 72. There are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 of them. Okay, so 12 factors of 72. So here's what I wanted you to take a look at. Um, I wanted you to take a look at the prime factorization of 72. So 72's prime factorization is um, uh, 2 to the third times 3 squared. So hopefully you were able to get to that prime factorization. And then the question is, is well, you know, what happens to each one of these factor pairs um, in terms of their prime factorization? So I'm going to write them down again um, with a little bit more space. So I get 1 and 72, right? I'll give myself a little space. And maybe what I'll do is um, write them down using different uh, colors. So I'll do... 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, and 8. And then on the right-hand side, I'll, I'll use the blue numbers. This will be 72, 36, 24, 18, um, 12, and 9. And then I'm supposed to find the prime factorization of each one of these numbers. I'll go ahead and draw in my lines so I can see what's going on here. So let's see, um, 72, well, one's prime factorization is unknown because it's, it's neither prime nor composite, but 72's prime factorization, of course, is two to the third times three squared. Two's prime factorization is two, and 36's prime factorization is 2 squared times 3 squared. Uh, 3's prime factorization, oh, I should have left this in green, right? 3's prime factorization is just 3. 4's prime factorization is 2 squared. 6's prime factorization is 2 times 3. And 8's prime factorization is 2 to the third. Um, so what's uh, going to happen over here? 24's prime factorization is going to be 2 to the third times 3. 18's prime factorization is 2 times 3 squared. Um, 12's prime factorization is 2 squared times 3. And 9's prime factorization is 3 squared. And here's what I really want you to notice, is, is how are these columns related to the number itself? So hopefully what you did notice is that, you know, when I take the prime factorization of any factor pair, you know, 2 and 36, I notice that the two pieces, I guess the, the two prime factorizations of the factors together make up the prime factorization of the number. And perhaps that's no surprise, but, um, but that's the way it works. That anytime you construct a factor pair, what you're really doing is you're just partitioning the prime factorization of the number. In other words, I'm kicking one two out of here and putting it there and putting the rest of it here. So this number must be 70, one less two than 72 because the two is in the factor pair over here. The same thing happens here with the three and 24. If I take one of the threes out and put it here, then I would only have three twos and a single three in its factor pair. 
Um, the same thing happens with four. If I put two of the threes out here, then I'm left with only, excuse me, two of the twos out here, then I'm left with only one two and the two threes over here. So here's 18's prime factorization. If I take one of the two and the three and put it over here, and then I, I must take one of the two and three out of the 72's prime factorization and put it here. If I kick the two threes over here, I've got to kick the three twos over there. So what does it mean when you have factor pairs in base 10 numbers in light of, I guess, what we think of unique prime factorization? Well, each one of these is just what I would call a partition of the prime factorization, right? It's a split um, of, of, of the prime factorization into two groups um, with no more or no fewer factors than in the prime factorization of the number. I hope that gives you some insight into what prime factorization is good for. It's a complete multiplicative prediction of what the numbers um, divisibility rules are, and, and, it's, and it's what we call, um, it's the foundation of its multiplicative structure as a number. The way I like to think of it is um, these uh, prime bases in a number's prime decomposition or prime factorization are like atoms, and they're put together to make a molecule, but they can be broken down into submolecules, and the submolecules are, are like factor pairs. But of course, the breaking down doesn't add anything in or take anything away. Um, uh, everything is contained. All right. So let's try one of these. What if I gave you the prime factorization of 153? It's 3 squared times 17. Could you then produce a list of all of its factors? OK, let's give that a try. Fifty-three is three squared times seventeen. All right. So if we know that's the case, then one factor pair um, would be one and three squared times seventeen, which we could then um, rewrite. Let's, let's put a double line here uh, and single lines over here just so we can get a sense. So it would be 1 and 153. Is everybody okay with that so far? So then the smallest number that I could push to this side would be a 3. If I push a 3 to that side, then I'm left with just a 3 times a 17 on this side. And 3 times 17, that's 21, 51. So it looks like... Um, 51 and 3 is another factor pair. OK, so the next smallest number I can kick out of here looks like it'd be 3 squared. Um, so if I kick a 3 squared out of here, which is just a 9, then what's left in here is a 17, which is just a 17. And then things get a little bit more interesting. Let's see, so what would be the next biggest number? 3 times 17 would be 1, or just 17 itself would be 1. But if I kick 17 itself over here, um, that's the same thing as this one up here as being just 17. So I believe, um, let's see, um, yeah, let's give it a try. 3 times 17. Um, I might have them. Um, 3 times 17 and 3 over here. So it appears that I have them all, doesn't it? Um, that seems wrong to me for some reason. Why? What am I missing here? Oh, no, I think it is right. I think it is right. So in other words, if I partition three things, um, you know, two, th there's only a few ways that I can do it. And I believe these are all the factors. So let's, um, let's just gather them up. Um, the factors of 153 are as follows. So they can be uh, 1, 3, uh, 3 squared, which is 9. So 1, 3, 9, 17, 51, and 153. So there are exactly six factors for 153. And there can be no other because I can't find any other way to partition this. Um, into two equal sets that together add, uh, together multiply to make the number. Let's take a look at another way we could think about this. So we could think 
about 153 as 3 squared times 17. We've got two 3's and a 17, so think of it like um, 3, 3, and 17, right? And we know that if we're partitioning, what we're doing is we're selecting pieces of the number, right? So certainly 3 will work, and certainly 17 will work. So factors here, 3 and 17. Then I could pick them in groups of 2. So I could have this number, 3 times 3, which would be 9. Or I could have this number. 3 times 17, which would be 51, right? Um, and then 3 times 17 here would be the same thing as 3 times 17 here. Wouldn't need to list it twice. And then the only other thing that I could do to pick it uniquely would be to pick the whole thing, right? I mean, to pick the whole thing. Oh, my purple is very hard to see. So maybe I'll do that in black. So when I pick the whole thing, of course, I get 153. And this is the hard part, is, is you always have to remember that 1 is a factor, and nowhere in this diagram is 1 shown. So I guess to, to pair with this one, we need a 1. Um, that's just the identity rule, I guess, for multiplication. So there you have it, the same six factors, which you can think of as selecting um, bits and pieces in all possible ways, or as partitioning the prime factorization in all possible ways to get factor pairs. So I hope that helps you get some sense about what um, what prime, I guess, factorizations are good for. They, they help to predict the multiplicative structure of a number. <clears throat> this is all, um, you know, basically an expression of an important theorem in mathematics um, that's called the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. And what it really says uh, what it says is that any natural natural number greater than one can be written as a unique product of prime numbers up to the ordering of the factors. So the fact that the, the really important, I guess, piece of this um, is that we can find a prime factorization, but that the prime factorization is unique. If it's unique, then what that means is it disallows any other divisors, right? And that's why every factor of a number will be some subset of its prime factorization or every factor pair will be some partitioning of its prime factorization. Well, here's an interesting question. We've been talking about primes and prime factorizations. Um, let's end on this. Is there an infinite number of primes? Um, so I'd be curious what your intuition tells you. I mean, when you when we go back, let's say, to our, our picture of the sieve of Aristophanes, you know, it does seem like there's in quite a few primes distributed as we go from 1 to 100, although in that last row we only have one. And so you might ask yourself, well, you know, do you keep finding more and more primes the further up we go um, in the counting numbers? And let's just um, talk about that for a second. <clears throat> so let's suppose that you were convinced that there are um, a finite number of primes, okay? So if, if that was the case, do you agree that if, if it was finite, then we could list them? You know, there'd be this first prime, that's two, the second prime, that's three, the third prime, that's five, but that, you know, we could keep listing these up until we got to the biggest prime, the largest one, we'll call it P sub n, and this would be a finite list, and there would be a finite number of primes. Um, well, here's what I ask you to consider if you believe there's a finite number of primes. Consider um, the number n. And what I'm going to make n is the product of all these, p1 times p2 times p3 times all the way up to pn. And then I'm going to add 1 to it, OK? So there it is. It's the product of all of those finite list of primes, um, and then plus one more to it. Do you agree that you know if we had this list, we could multiply them all up and make some gigantic uh, number, and then we'd add one to it, right? Okay. So there are two things that n could be. N is is obviously bigger than than p1, and p1 uh, is is greater than one. So so either um, n is composite 
where n is prime. Okay, so if n is prime, then what's the problem? Well, if n's prime, then we found a number that's, you agree, that's bigger than all of these prime numbers because it's the product of all of them plus one, and it's, so it's not in the list. So if n is prime, um, we have a contradiction. As uh, n has got to be greater than this last prime, in other words, we found another prime given a finite list of primes. So if we have a contradiction, what that really means is that our assumption of finiteness must be wrong. So um, there must, uh, so it's, if, if we have a contradiction, then what can we say? So um, the number of primes um, must be infinite. So that's the first case. Do you agree? If n is prime, then we've got a contradiction, and and because n is bigger than that largest prime, and so our assumption that finite number of primes yeah, must be wrong. Well, let's like take a look at the other uh, case. Um, I guess really what I should say, so n must be composite, right? Um, um, that's really what I should say. Um, n must be composite, because if it's not prime, it's composite. Do you agree? But we're still going to get a contradiction. Here we go. Let's try this. Um, so if n is composite, uh, then the fundamental theorem of algebra, the FTA, um, says that n can be written as a product of primes. OK, so let's just think about that. Um, here I have a product of primes, but I've added one to it. So, so think about what would happen if n was divided by p sub 1. So if I divide it by p sub 1, then it's going to be p sub 1 times whatever this number is, plus one more. And since p sub 1 is not 1 itself, it's 2 or something bigger, then what that tells me is that when I divide by p sub 1, I get a remainder of 1, right? Um, but n divided by p sub 1 leaves remainder 1. And n divided by, by the same argument, if I divide it by p sub 2, it'll leave that remainder 1, because I'll just put p1 together with p3 through pn as the multiple of 2. But there'll be 1 extra left over. Um, so p sub 2 leaves remainder 1. And this will continue down until n divided by p sub n will leave remainder 1. So that means that n can't be written as a product of any of these primes. So n must have some other prime divisor other than p1 through pn, which again is a contradiction. So what does it mean if I get a contradiction here and a contradiction here? So that means that my assumption at the beginning of finite number of primes is wrong. So our assumption is false. And the number of primes is infinite. Certainly a complicated uh, um, argument, but I thought, you know, you're going to be teaching this. You're going to be teaching kids about primes, and, and you might get this question in class, you know. 
Uh, um, can you tell me if, if the, you know, you do the sieve of Aristophanes and somebody asks, is there an infinite number of primes? And, and now you can say that indeed there are, because if we assume there to be a finite number of primes and we construct this number, it leads to two contradictions that just can't be. And if that's the case, then our assumption must be false and there must be an infinite number of primes. So I hope that that uh, fills out your knowledge of prime number theory. And uh, I'll um, go ahead and conclude the video here and see you when I return on Monday.